Hello, TV fans. Uh, the Emmy Awards are coming up on uh, September 22nd, this Sunday. Uh, as we're recording this, uh, we are kind of agonizing over our Emmy predictions, uh, last minute thoughts, and uh, Emmy voting is over. So, you know, nothing that we think will change is really going to, you know, change the voters' minds at any point. Um, but we're going to talk about the drama categories. I'm Gold Derby Senior Editor Daniel Montgomery, here with my fellow editors Susan Wazina, Joyce Eng, and Marcus James Dixon. We're going to talk about the drama series categories gonna, that are going to be handed out on Sunday night, and Game of Thrones is going to win. Thank you for joining us. That is all the time we have. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we probably could end there for like the top category at least, but um, the nominees for Best Drama Series are Game of Thrones, Killing Eve, Better Call Saul, Ozark, Pose, Succession, This Is Us, and Bodyguard. Eight nominees in this category. Game of Thrones has 32 nominations overall. The next most nominated shows have nine <laughs> overall. I think uh, Killing Eve, Better Call Saul, uh, Ozark, and I think This Is Us all have nine total. Um, and Emmy still has 11. Handmaid's so Tale has 11, here. but it was not eligible for Best Drama Series because it's only nominated for those orphaned episodes that aired too late to be considered for, uh, for last year's Emmys. Um, so it didn't have enough episodes to be a full drama. Um, I, I just, everyone is predicting Game of Thrones, I assume. This is you know, not a fringe opinion. Um, so let's talk about what's in second place and why. I have Bodyguard. Uh, okay, uh, what, why do you think Bodyguard is in second that place? Was, that Marcus? was very and, abrupt, Mark. And, and we, we, it, it's good that we'll start here because then we can like really tell you why that's not the case. Uh, so why do you think Bodyguard is number two? <laughs> no, I was I was just joking. Um, I have it in dead last, but my second, <laughs> I've I've switched my second place a couple times. First, I. Ozark, then I had Killing Eve, but now, I don't know if it's because it's airing right now, or what? Succession does not deserve to be in, what, fifth place, as you read off earlier, Daniel? It does not deserve that low. It is going to probably it's, it's win in directly. It's in our odds, actually. That's way too low. Yeah. Um, if, if everyone watching this has it down low, because maybe that's just what the odds have it as, you need to bump that up. Maybe the second or third. It's it's um, way overshadowed by Game of Thrones on HBO. Like none of the actors got in, but that's all going to change next year when Game of Thrones is out. Succession is really going to dominate. Yeah, I yeah. I kind of agree with you, Marcus. There in that you know because if it were just this season of this Succession being considered, um, I would say it's down low. But the, since this episode, this new season aired this summer and it's gotten so much more buzz. Than it got last season, I think that might rub off on his chances. Succession here. is the best show airing right now, um, and I do think if they, if the voting system didn't offer unlimited slots uh, for nominations, that a Succession actor or two would have gotten in. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's. I agree that it should be higher in our odds, but I don't think obviously that it will be Game of Thrones. But I think it's sneak out a win elsewhere. I do think like not having any actors nominated nominated hurts it a little bit um but yeah like next year it, it'll fill up a bunch of slots i think and uh what do you think uh is the runner-up susan i picked killing eve because <laughs> it's about a woman so <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, well, actually, you know, I mean, the Emmys have been really good to female-led shows in recent years. Uh, you know, you know, Big Little Lies, Olive Kitteridge, Veep, uh, Handmaid's Tale, uh, even The Crown, even though it hasn't won Best Drama Series, it's won uh, several awards uh, across categories. Um, so I, I have Killing Eve in second also. Um, I think sort of like the succession uh, factor, it aired very recently. It aired uh, its second season uh in late spring so it has that recency uh quality that better call saul and ozark don't have because they aired so long ago um i think if succession i think succession we're really looking at for next year though that's that's my i, I think maybe succession is second or third this year i think it could surprise in maybe a writing or directing category which we'll talk about later 
Um, but I, so I, I think it's we're really looking at Succession to be a potential heavyweight next year, sort of like how shows like Killing Eve and Ozark took until their second year this year to really catch on. Um, so, you know, we all have Game of Thrones winning that. I think it's a little bit more su suspenseful in the acting categories. Let's start with drama actress there, uh, where the nominees are Sandra O oh for Killing Eve, Jodie Comer for Killing Eve, uh, Laura Linney for Ozark, Mandy Moore for This Is Us, Amelia Clark for Game of Thrones, Robin Wright for House of Cards, and Viola Davis for How to Get Away with Murder. So seven nominees in this category. Sandra O oh is the front runner according to our odds uh, of the more than a thousand users who have made their predictions um, at Gold Derby. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there, Joyce? I still have her in first, but not confidently because Jody Comer is here. Um, I have Laura Lenny in second. Uh, I feel like if they split the vote. She having won for every single role she's been nominated. Um, I I think she she could be like one of the Ozark representatives. Although I guess Julia Garner could also be that too. Um, but yeah, I have her in second. Um, I I feel like the thing. I think we've all talked about this with Killing Eve is that, you know, Sandra won all of her awards this year for season one and Jodi had the better second season. And this is her first nomination, the first time they're facing off here because Jodi didn't get in last year. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of like your preference of if you're going to choose between the two of them. And I feel like the diehard fans maybe have more of and adoration for Jody's performance in season two, but maybe the industry as a whole feel more for Sandra, who's a veteran and has him last year. <laughs> so she has 10 total. Um, I, I'm not gonna say like she's gonna, you know, win more than one, but I think this would be her best shot of winning one of those four. So I think she, she can like eke it out here. Yeah, what are you predicting, Susan? Sandra O oh, and Joyce knows better than me why. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, obviously she's got four nominations, so you know they they kind of like her, and uh, she hopefully will win one. And this one, I think, is it. Yeah, I think this is this is the one place that they're likely to award her if they award her in one place i do think there's a chance she can go home empty-handed um but uh what, what do you yeah. think Marcus? i also don't don't think they realize that like she's nominated for like the globes <laughs> oh yeah they probably don't yeah <laughs> uh what do you think marcus uh, <clears throat> i think for you now andrew o was lead and jody comer was supporting they would both win and now looking at the supporting nominees, how there's, you know, all those Game of Thrones ladies, Jodi Comer up against all of them and Julia Garner and Fiona Shaw, Jodi would win in a heartbeat. So I, I really wish they would have done that because Kelly would have two Emmys. Right now, I'm not thinking that it's going to win anything. I have Laura Linney winning Best Actress because of, you know, everything Joyce said about the voice, uh, sorry, the vote split. And as a voter, I don't even know who I would vote for. Yes, Sandra O. Oh, maybe for the career achievement, but Jodie Comer did better in season two. So they're both going to get a ton of votes and that, that's what leads to a vote. But there's two co-stars nominated. Do they split the vote? But in, in certain situations where there really is no front runner, that's when it happens. So I could also see Amelia Clark benefiting from the vote split. Uh, a couple of our experts are picking that, but I'm just going to go with Laura Linney because they love her so much. Yeah, this category is keeping me up at night the most. I think this is actually a five-way race. Um, uh, I think Sandra Oh could win just because she's one overdue. Two, Killing Eve is so big, and um, you know she won everything over the course of the season. There's a sort of momentum to want to reward her. Uh, Jodie Comer could win because she had such a big second season and she's a little reminiscent of another bbc america actress who took on multiple personas who won this category in a surprise so jody mm -hmm. comer could win like tatiana maslani although tatiana maslani wasn't nominated against multiple versions of herself she just played them all in one nomination 
Um, Laura Linney could <laughs> capitalize on a vote split. They love Ozark this season, and they love her always. Um, Amelia Clark could capitalize on a vote split, and she's the only uh, nominee from Game of Thrones in this category, which helps her. And Game of Thrones had such a big final season. Uh, and voters might feel, you know, voters who love the season will vote for her. Voters who didn't like the season might vote for her because they feel bad for the writing that she had to, you know, sort of uh, uh, work with. The Emmy nominated writing. I know. I will talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> But and I, the, the fifth one, I think, is Mandy Moore. The voters love, the, the actors branch of the Academy especially, loves This Is Us. Um, this is her first nomination. It could be a case of getting the nomination was the hardest part. Uh, the show wins an acting award every year. Um, she's the most likable in this category in terms of her character. She uh, is incredibly sympathetic and huggable. There's no one else in this category who is particularly huggable. Um, which doesn't always matter, but you know, if it does matter, that could help her here in a everyone open else race is involved with, with, with murder. So yeah, everyone else, yeah. everyone else has either killed someone or <laughs> laundered something, or you know, it, it's 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 a Covered lot up. of criminal underworld in well, this category. Crack plot death. <laughs> she had nothing to do with that. Yeah, she is an innocent bystander in that crockpot death, and she was right. not the one Rebecca who told Pearson Jack has to. not killed anybody. She and she was not the one who told Jack to go back in for the dog. So she is <laughs> not responsible for <laughs> for any deaths on This Is Us yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, there's still seasons we could find out there are skeletons literally in her closet. Um, so. I think that's a five-way race, and so we have just muddied that category up for everyone watching. Uh, so, you know, good a time as any to leave people twisting in the wind on that and move on to drama actor, uh, where you've got Billy Porter for Pose, Jason Bateman for Ozark, Bob Odenkirk for Better Call Saul, Sterling K. Brown and Milo Ventimiglia for This Is Us, and Kit Harington for Game of Thrones. Now, this is another wide-open category. Uh, the only past winner of this category in here is Sterling K. Brown, who won two years ago. But I don't know. You know, He's got a vote split with Milo Ventimiglia, who's been getting better and better material over the course of the seasons. And so they've sort of pulled up to sort of even with each other. So I don't necessarily think mm -hmm. Sterling is going to... They're going to necessarily go back to Sterling. I'm predicting Billy Porter, because it feels like... You know, Pose just aired the summer at second season, even though voters are voting on the first season. His episode submission, if voters watch it, is dynamite. Um, you know, and, you know, he's, he's sort of... I, I feel like there's, there'd be a lot of passion around him, not just around this performance and this character in this show, but him as sort of just this growing industry figure, uh, as this really uh, outspoken, uh, 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 you know gay black actor who is really uh uh you know representing for underrepresented uh people and that's what pose is all about in, in a great way so i'm predicting billy porter but again he's untested here so i'm not entirely certain what do you think is going to happen marcus yeah billy's the talk of the town right now he's so popular he's everywhere on every talk show every red carpet and as you said, the, the season was air the new one was airing as they were voting on you know, season one. It's funny because, you know, when nominations came out, I was convinced Jason Bateman was going to win. But I've since, you know, calmed down on that prediction. I think Ozark's going to win actress and maybe supporting actress. But I think this is where FX gets a big win. They just won for Matthew Reese last year for the Americans. And Joyce, say your statistic about, you know, this category with, with first season shows. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, since 2011, every winner here has been from a first season show or a final season show. So the only two people who qualify this year are uh, Billy and Kit Harrington. <laughs> once for first season, Kit. once for last season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it'll be Kit. So... Uh, you know, going yeah, with of all the of all the Game of Thrones really. acting nominees, no offense, Kit, like I, I think he's dead last. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think is going to happen, Susan? I'm playing it safe with Jason Bateman, so because hmm. he showed up last year winning stuff already, so I think that's a safer bet. But he keeps getting nominated like, for directing too. Like, what's that about? Yeah, they love him. Yeah, well. 
and producing this year since uh, Ozark is up for best drama series. So he's got three, and he's never won. So he's got that overdue narrative. Although he's got those nominations spread out over a couple of categories, some here, some you know, a couple before for uh, Arrested Development. So I'm not sure. He, he, it doesn't, it's not like an Angela Lansbury where he's nominated every year and he hasn't won. It's, he's almost more like Bradley Cooper where he's like, people may not realize how many he's gotten without winning. Um, so, uh, but he did just win the SAG Awards, so I think that works in his favor. The fact that he's a director and a producer also works in his favor. The episode he submitted will have directed by Jason Bateman uh, on the beginning of it if, if voters watch it. Uh, so that could impress voters. Um, so, yeah, I think that's very possible. I also think Bob Odenkirk is very possible, just because, you know, Better Call Saul is overdue for a win, and it feels like this is the most open this category has been for him. Uh, what do you think, Joyce? Yeah, I have him winning mostly as a hope diction, because I want him to win, and I want Better Call Saul to win an Emmy. Um, but I may or may not switch to Billy um, like on Sunday, <laughs> like right before the prediction center closes. Cause I, I do think like Billy has a lot of things working for him and like, he is like the breakout star in multiple ways this year. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's more that I want Bob Oldenkirk to win. And I did this two years ago when I knew Sterling was winning and I still had Bob until like the day before. And I finally switched to Sterling. <laughs> I just don't see why season four would do it for Bob. I mean, why not the other seasons? Like, I mean, the good thing is, special? is like this is this is the first time um, Better Call Saul has increased in acting nominations. You know, it got Giancarlo in and Michael McKean and Guest, so that is a good sign because it was just him and Jonathan Banks for three years. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it sucks that it's never won a single Emmy in any category. So, yeah, yeah I think like this is one of those shows that they respect and like but might not love and i and i do think like what daniel said like this is probably one of the more open years for him that he could like sneak in and win yeah i think um uh, better call saul they've waited so long to reward it i feel like if it if you know when it ends it has a really huge finish like you know, Breaking Bad did a really yeah, like you know it's gonna finish. lead into like Breaking Bad, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so I feel like they might mm -hmm. hold out on Bob Odenkirk until Better Call Saul: The Return of the King. Uh, so they, they might just like be <laughs> putting all their chips in that basket. Um, so yeah, we're, so we're a little divided there. Um, actually, very divided. Three predictions among yeah, the maybe four of us. Maybe Bob is going to have like a, a guest spot or a supporting role in the new Breaking Bad movie. So maybe he can win next year a supporting actor in a movie. Um, he could. Um, it would be interesting to see where those dovetail because he went into witness protection and Aaron Paul is uh, he like somewhere. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that would be interesting mm -hmm. to see if that happens. That would be a. That'd be to give him like one great scene with like one great speech or something just to put him on the ballot, give him enough screen time to qualify him. Yeah. <laughs> put him in for best supporting actor. Uh, supporting actors might be similarly confusing. Um, we've got four nominees for Game of Thrones Maisie Williams, Lena Headey, Gwendolyn Christie, and Sophie Turner up against. Fiona Shaw for Killing Eve and Julia Garner for Ozark because of that vote splitting and because Game of Thrones anyway doesn't win for anyone besides Peter Dinklage. Uh, Julia Garner has been uh, on top of our odds and uh, I'm actually going out on a limb here and saying that there will be a vote split but it's actually going to benefit Fiona Shaw. Um, <clears throat> You know, she could be the Anne Dowd this year where, uh, you know, she's nominated for supporting for one role and guest for another role, and they give her the supporting prize. Uh, Killing Eve, as we mentioned before, has more support from the Academy this year. Three acting nominations, drama series, writing, directing. Uh, of course, only the, uh, you know, not every branch of the Academy is voting for actors, but I feel like... You know, I, I, I just, I, I, there's a, I have a skepticism around Julia Garner. Like, you know, she got the SAG nomination, which is huge from her peers. But we know Netflix just backs the truck, or, you know, the SAG Awards back the truck up to Netflix every time they get the chance. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure that's necessarily going to commute, you know, to uh, uh, 
translate here, especially because Fiona Shaw really doesn't have a chance at SAG being, you know, if you're going to vote for two Killing Eve women and the SAG Awards, it's going to be Sandra and Jody in one order or the other. Uh, so Fiona wouldn't really necessarily get that uh, attention there where there are only five slots in one acting category. So I'm going with Fiona Shaw, going out on a limb. I might be wrong. I very well might be wrong. I'll probably be wrong in all these other categories I'm more <laughs> sure about anyway. But yeah, I'm going for Fiona Shaw. What do you think is going to happen, Susan? I'm playing it safe with Julia Garner. <laughs> so I liked her in Grandma with um, Lily <laughs> Yeah, she's, she's, also, like, yeah. she's very young, but she's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. she's been. She's I love her. She was on Americans like, and Dirty John. <laughs> And this year too. wasn't nominated for anything, but she was a maniac. She played uh, Emma Stone's sister uh, in a in a really major role there. Uh, so yeah, but I yeah, I, I just can't wrap like for some reason I can't see her up at the podium with that Emmy, and she very well might uh, yeah. win it. But um, what do you think, Marcus? I feel the same way. I just don't think she has the name recognition yet to be like ooh Emmy winner Julia Garner. Don't get me wrong, she is fantastic on the show, and she is putting on a performance like. Watch her interview. Uh, I forget who did it at Gold Derby with her, but she's so different in real life than in her character. So that can definitely help her. But I, I have Maisie Williams, and I, I don't, I can't explain why exactly. But she, I mean, after the episode, what was it, the, the Long Night, it was the one where she uh, killed the bad guy at the end. It was just the talk of the town, and everyone was like, "Oh, Maisie Williams just won an Emmy. She just won an Emmy." And yeah, Lena Headey is is maybe the career achievement award winner, but she did not have any material. Let's just be honest. In the final season, as much as I would love Lena Headey to win an Emmy for this role, I don't know if the material warrants it, and that kills me to say. I mean, Gwendolyn Christie. She's more like the heart vote. She's the one you want to hug of all, you know, you don't want to hug anyone on Game of Thrones except for <laughs> uh, Gwendolyn Christie, right? And she had the big episode where she becomes a knight. And I think I'm convincing myself of a vote split. So maybe Julia Garner by default. But right now, Maisie Williams, in a week, I'm going to probably change it. See, the thing about this category is that under the previous system where, you know, you have small panels of voters watching all the episode submissions, um, Maisie Williams would be a lock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, like, the, you know, there are six episodes. And also this ranking season. them. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> there were six episodes this season, um, four nominees here, which means most of the season was submitted to uh, Emmy voters in this category. And watching those four episodes through them, Maisie Williams has the best story arc by far. Uh, none of these other nominees touches her. Um, <clears throat> even, especially. Um, uh, Lena Headey's submission, she submitted The Bells, which was the only thing she really had, the one where she cries and dies in the Red Keep. Um, but that episode was so much better for Maisie, even. So, mm. uh, yeah, if this were the old tape system and ranking the nominees, it would be Maisie in a walk, I feel like. Um, the other thing that gives me pause, same thing with yeah. Julia Garner, no 20-something actor has won this award since Katherine Heigl. Um, which, uh, you know, age is um, not, like, youth is not necessarily something that the uh, Television Academy goes for, although the roles played by Maisie Williams and Julia Garner, they're very mature roles on grown-up shows, so I don't think that's, that age factor is going to necessarily be what hurts them. Um, but, yeah, uh, what do you think, Joyce? Uh, I don't really want to think about this category too much, <laughs> just so I just have Julia... <laughs> And Fiona went into, I'm um, just working on like the vote split mm. factor, a lot of what Marcus just said, just because uh, there's four of them, um, the Game of Thrones ladies, and like there's yeah. no one real obvious choice when you're up against a ghost star, which is what you need to beat them. Um, yeah, you know, like Leaning is overdue, Maisie has the best arc and the most iconic uh, moment last season. And Gwendolyn has just been writing this campaign narrative of her self-submission, which so many people think is like this new thing and how could HBO do her dirty, but this is a very common thing just to submit yourself. But anyway, like that's like what most of her press has been about and she's done interviews about it and everything. And yeah, like she had the, she, her submission's the best episode of the season when she gets knighted. 
Um, and we haven't talked about Sophie, and no offense, Sophie, but she, you know, <laughs> Sansa didn't really get to do much. I mean, she got to be queen in the north at the end, but um, I think mm-hmm. I think of the four of them, she's last. But I I can see yeah. any of the other three winning. So the nomination I- is the win. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is her first one. I mean, it's Gwendolyn's first one too, but um, Gwendolyn had better material. So I just, I just have Julia there <laughs> right now, and this one is like, I don't really care if I'm wrong. I'm just like, I'm just putting her there. Yeah, mm. this is this is we have Sophie Turner. I, you know, when we saw, we knew that Game of Thrones was submitting the main three: Maisie, Lena, and Sophie for the ballot. And you know, Game of Thrones has always been very subjective or uh, very selective about what they submit on the ballot, so they don't split up you know the support too many ways um which is why gwendolyn submitted herself and there was enough support for all four of them to get in i was most worried about sophie when i saw gwendolyn on the ballot because i think if there are only three women from game of thrones in the category then gwendolyn's going to get that nomination above sophie um but you know so i'm glad they both got in just because i feel i would have felt bad for sophie getting left out um, I almost wish she had submitted like the finale episode, which she has almost nothing to do in. But she has that uncle, please sit. <laughs> oh my god, that's that the, the best, best moment! I would give her an Emmy just for of that. the entire <laughs> yeah. season. Just like her entire like, Emmy reel <laughs> is just like thirty seconds long, and it's that scene. And boom, I would almost mark her off her name for that. Um, I, I have a question: If if Jodie Comer was nominated here, I'm going to go back to this. Would you think she would win against these six? Because I think it would be you know a no-brainer that she was in a walk i mean yeah not even close it it, you know but the problem is i think she actually had more screen time than uh than Mm. uh sandra oh this season it would be really hard like even even by like you know look at oscar standards like rooney mara and carol or you know alicia vikander in Mm -hmm. danish girl you know uh uh uh, jody comer is so a co-lead in this that it's you know it would be, it would look really weird for her to win, but if she were in supporting, she'd win in without any shadow of a doubt. I just want to say Rhea Seahorn was robbed of a nomination. That's all. Yes. Honestly, I think she could have won if she had made it in because of a vote split and the support behind mm-hmm. Better Call Saul and the overdue narrative that she had never been nominated before. Um, so, yeah. and next Susan year there will be. Watson. Yeah, and, and next year there will be four slots open, but we're going to have an avalanche of shows that were in here before, like Handmaid's Tale and uh, Stranger Things and Westworld, so, and The Crown. And Big Little Lies. And Big Little Lies, so wow. I don't know if Meryl actually Street's it's going to be worse for everyone than, than uh, this race is. Um, so moving on to Supporting Actor, which is a little easier, I think. Um, the nominees, we've got three nominees for Game of Thrones, Peter Dinklage, Nikolai Costa-Waldau, and Alfie Allen. Two nominees for Better Call Saul, Jonathan Banks and Giancarlo Esposito. Then you've got Michael Kelly for House of Cards and Chris Sullivan for This Is Us. Uh, I feel like we're all probably going Dinklage because this is the one case where a vote split probably doesn't happen because... One, we know they like Peter Dinklage more than they like anyone else from Game of Thrones, because he's won three times. Um, He has been nominated in this category more than anyone else in history. He has won it more than anyone else in history, tied with Aaron Paul. Um, Could break that tie if he wins a fourth time this year. Um, And he had better material than Nikolai Costa-Waldau and Alfie Allen this season. Mm -hmm. So that one-two punch makes it look pretty easy for Dinklage. Um, I don't think it's impossible that someone else could win, but it's an uphill climb. Uh, what do you think, Joyce? Yeah, I think he'll get the record. Um, but I will say that he's never had to beat uh, multiple co-stars before. Because um, he he and Kit lost to uh, the ghost of Ben Mendelsohn, obviously. <laughs> and then last year he just beat Nikolai. So this is the first time he's facing two. But um, I, I don't think, like you said, like that really be too much of a factor. It'll be hilarious if after all of these acting nominations for Game of Thrones, he is still the only person who wins. I know. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, that sort of thing has happened before. Uh, mm-hmm. ER, uh, Juliana Margulies was the only regular and, actor and in the first ever se- one for the show. I mean, it got some guest wins, but just the first season, and she was supposed to die. <laughs> It won a couple of guest awards, but never a regular award after Juliana Margulies won Supporting Actress for the first season. Mad Men only won for John Hamm and not until the last season. Yeah. Um, but also in both those cases, it was just one win 
for like the regular class. Like he will have four. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is it is unique and and strange. Yeah. Uh, it would be almost like if James Gandolfini won three times for The Sopranos and literally no one else ever did. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Uh, where are you going with this market? Yeah, I, I, of all the, the categories where there's potential vote splits, I don't think this is one. I think Peter Dinklage is so far above his co-stars that that they're going to be may maybe like sixth and seventh. I don't know. Uh, but he was just so good this season. And, you know, when he's won in the past, I'm like, really? He, you know, he won a, a, all the competition. But this year, like, even I'm voting for him in the Gold Derby Awards. You know what I mean? Like, he was just that good, especially in the finale. He had all those speeches, and Emmy voters just loved the speeches. Um, if anyone could upset him, maybe Jonathan Banks or Giancarlo Esposito. But which one do they choose? I guess Jonathan Banks, because he's... He's been on the show since the beginning, and Giancarlo just joined in season three. So it's it's hard to pick a second place here, isn't it? Like, I don't know. I think Jonathan Banks is, like, perennially in second place. <laughs> <laughs> he was supposed Never to win four years ago, place. and then Peter won, and, like, even felt guilty about it. So. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. do think Michael Kelly is maybe toward the bottom of the list, and Chris Sullivan, just because of, you know, the... the tough competition that they face here. Yeah. What do you think, Susan? I would always go with Peter Dinklage, no matter what he did. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I mean, I actually watched whatever episodes I watched of Game of Thrones, basically because I wanted to watch him on TV. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think um, what's interesting here is that they're, I mean, Alfie Allen got nominated. I like Joey said. I don't think that's going to cause a significant vote split because I I don't think he's going to get very much support at all. Like you know, one it's his kind of like oh, it's nice he got nominated. Yeah, it's nice he yeah. got nominated. But even then, his he's he was barely eligible for this category because he died in episode three. Um, and even in the episodes he was in, he's not in them very much. So like. You know, there's no, I don't see a path where anyone who watches Game of Thrones and Alfie Allen is the person they go with. Um, and like Marcus said, like, Peter Dinklage has won on a couple of his worst nominations. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, where it's just like, why, why him? Why now? Like, he's had great work on the season. The season he was on trial, uh, you know, and he had that huge speech. Yeah. He lost for that season. Yeah, he's, he's won for, like, his wrong seasons. Yeah. And this it's is kind of like a show, time. too, with drama series. Yeah. And this is the one time where actually his status as frontrunner and his material in the season actually matches. Like, he had, yeah. like, of all the people Game of Thrones did dirty this season, the two people it was kindest to, I would say we talked about Maisie Williams had the best arc uh, of the supporting actress nominees, and Peter Dinklage had tons of great material, and he did great with it. Um, so this is the one, not a win, I don't think anyone would complain about. I, I think, honestly, if you look back at Game of Thrones history, his ideal wins would have been season one and season eight, like, and that's it. Just like let let someone else have those middle. If they died by the end, say that again. That, if they die, <laughs> um, not necessarily. I mean, you know, some people win this after dying. Um, I mean, some people win this as ghosts, as we've mentioned. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah. So uh, I I really. Yeah, and the worst thing about Better Call Saul for them in this category is that they were both nominated this time. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if there is any sentiment towards, I don't want to give it to Peter Dinklage again, like, Jonathan Banks has never won, he's overdue, but Giancarlo Esposito hasn't won, so he's overdue, and the last time mm -hmm. Esposito was nominated for Breaking Bad, he looked like a frontrunner, but then he, he should have won. Him. He lost to Aaron. Um, he, yeah. he, under this system, he might have, but under that system, when tapes were still paramount, uh, Aaron Paul really had Aaron Paul was a great like submitter. Yeah, he was a, mm -hmm. an amazing submitter, and he had, like, an episode, I, th I think he submitted an episode where he found out that, like, um, uh, that, that uh, Walter uh, White poisoned the, yeah. the little girl, um, and huge uh, emotional uh, outpouring, and he basically submitted a version of that twice, <laughs> and one to it both times. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, that, the bad luck for Better Call Saul is having two people here at a time when vote splitting is gonna hurt them the most. 
So um, when we did the comedy slugfest, I, I mentioned that I hope Julia is going to give like a really good speech for the final season. And I'm going to echo that with Peter Dinklage. Like you've won a lot. We've seen a lot of Peter Dinklage speeches. So you need to do. I don't remember any Peter Dinklage speeches. Exactly. Like, his his speeches are so generic. Terrible. <laughs> so he needs to c contact, you know, some great TV writers like Aaron Sorkin or David E. Kelly to give him the best Emmy speech ever. You know that um, that um, Peter Dinklage gif, the the meme where he's like on set of Game of Thrones and he's like dancing. Yeah. He should yeah. just do that live up to the podium, <laughs> uh, and that will be That's a moment. The word, just dance. <laughs> Uh, so moving on to the uh, writing and directing categories, which honestly might be the most confusing here because there's so many different factors at play. Let's start with drama directing. Um, you've got three episodes nominated for Game of Thrones, The Long Night, The Iron Throne, and The Last of the Starks. And then you've got uh, Succession uh, for the episode Celebration by director uh, Oscar winner Adam McKay, uh, Holly for The Handmaid's Tale, Reparations for Ozark and Desperate Times from Killing Eve. Um, this is another case where I don't know that Game of Thrones vote splitting is going to necessarily be a problem because the long, like, the last of the starts, I don't think is going to be a factor at all. I think it's really going to be people choosing between the Long Night and the Iron Throne. And the Long Night is so much more of a spectacle, so much more obviously directed. It's very much the Battle of the Bastards of this uh, lineup. Uh, so I'm predicting The Long Night to win. Uh, I also think Celebration from Succession could surprise here, just because the Adam McKay factor, it's the only nominee in this category from Succession. And as Marcus mentioned, Succession is on the rise this summer, uh, airing its second season, getting so much more buzz and acclaim. Uh, so I'm, I'm between those two, but uh, Marcus, what do you think? Succession, I think, is going to win something. And I do have it winning main title theme music over at the Creative Arts. Um, and I think it's going to win something on the, on the primetime ceremony. So this is where, if you think it's going to win, this is where it's going to win. I don't think it's going to win writing. And you're right about Adam McKay. They love giving the film directors Emmys, like Martin Scorsese and David Fincher in the recent years. Stephen Daldry just, last year. Yeah, he, and Adam fits that bill. And he, he's greatly helped by the fact that there's three Game of Thrones episodes. Last of the Starks and Seventh. The Long Night and Iron Throne and Two and Three. And, and so they're both going to get votes. And, and that is what's going to help, you know, a, a third place contender win. So I have Succession being that surprise contender. But, I mean, it could be Jason Bateman for Ozark. This is his second nomination in directing which is insane. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, Joyce, well, uh, where are you going with in this category? Uh, I have Succession winning. I I can, I mean, like last year, we just had I'm beating two Game of Thrones episodes, so Game of Thrones is not unbeatable here, even though um, it won two in a row uh, in 15 and 16. Um, so, and the fact that there's three of them, even though uh, um, the Long Night is the obvious choice. Like, I, I do feel like people still remember that that was the episode where no one could see. And <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit more on the cinematographer and it's not up for cinematography, but still like, that was very annoying. <laughs> and it was over an hour long. Um, and, you know, Adam McKay won the DJ this year um, for Succession. And I, I think like it, the show is peaking right now at the right time. It, the season two premiere uh, was right before voting started. So that could have an impact. And it's it's just, you know, you know his directing. Like, it's not that same style as his films, but it's still, like, flashy. And it set the tone because that, that's the pilot. Um, he set the tone for the series. So I could see that, like, that show was, like, the thinking man's, like, show. Like, you know, so I could see it getting a win there. So I just have Succession at one, and I have Long Night in second. What are you predicting, Susan? I'm playing it safe with Long Night. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the other one in second. So. Yeah, that, and I also, I want to mention Holly from The Handmaid's Tale. 
Uh, Handmaid's Tale has one for directing before. Uh, I think they'd definitely be in drama series if they were eligible for it. Uh, they're the second most nominated drama series of the year. So I would say Holly is in there too. I actually have Holly in my top three. Uh, I think it's Long Night and Succession, then Handmaid's Tale for Holly. Uh, I feel like this could be like a really weird win where, you know, because that was a, a really particularly good episode and um yeah so so i I, i'm a little bit wary of that one winning as well um so for speaking of which for best drama writing uh holly is also nominated there along with uh nice and neat from killing eve uh the iron throne from game of thrones which is its only nomination in this category nobody is ever missing from succession winner from better call saul and episode one of bodyguard now, this one, I could be convinced to change my mind. I'm predicting Killing Eve almost by default because it feels like the most writerly show and it's the showrunner Emerald Fennel from season two um, who doesn't have quite the name recognition that Phoebe Waller-Bridge had did last year, so I'm not sure how much there's going to be uh, like an eagerness to reward her writing as opposed to maybe there would be if Phoebe were still writing it. Um, and Nice but, and Neat but, isn't I, necessarily... Can I add something? Okay. I don't know if the if the voters know that Phoebe didn't write this episode. I don't know if they're aware of that. So that could definitely that she help. like left the show in season two. <laughs> yeah, I think they're like, "Ooh, I love Phoebe. I'm going to vote for Killing Eve," but she actually didn't write this episode. Okay, yeah. sorry. Continue. No, uh, uh, absolutely a possibility. Um, and uh, but the, my issue here is that Nice and Neat isn't really the most memorable episode of the season. Uh, uh, for me, at least, it. it uh, so I, I'm not sure if the voters are really looking at these episode titles and thinking, "Oh, I remember Holly." Oh, I remember the Iron Throne. Uh, you know, winner of the finale of Better Call Saul, the season finale, episode one, of course, of Bodyguard. You know, if, if you've seen Bodyguard, you know what episode one is. Um, so I'm a little bit worried that the episode doesn't quite have the uh, sort of, in in a sense, name recognition as some of these other episodes. Um, which makes me worry about Iron Throne, even though Iron Throne was a very divisive episode um, from a very divisive season written by very divisive showrunners. <laughs> so, like, as many people might love it as hate it, enough people loved it to get it nominated, and there's no, going to be no internal vote splitting. And Game of Thrones has won this award dubiously in the past, and I say dubiously because it won for Battle of the Bastards, which, I mean... It has the pussy line. Yeah, and there wasn't that much <laughs> writing in it. It was a big battle episode with a lot of swords and clanging and stuff like that, and not a huge amount of dialogue and storytelling. And um, Mother's Mercy. <laughs> yeah, and Mother's Mercy. Uh, so, like, they, they nominated the show in places, you know, or they awarded the show for episodes where it was really felt like we love the show, we're just going to give it writing. And this year, if there's any case of we love the show, it's the year it has 32 nominations. So I'm a little wary of it. I think I, I didn't have it in second when I started talking. I had it in third, and I'm moving it up to second at the mm -hmm. very least. Um, and then Succession, again, another case where it peaked at the right time. Uh, season two premiered right before voting started. And uh, as much as Adam McKay is a big name for the show, it's a very writing-heavy show. Uh, very writing-driven show, so it could win here as well. So I'm very confused. Uh, what are you? What, where are you going with this, Susan? I'm playing it safe again. <laughs> <laughs> I think killing you. Susan's gonna beat all of us. <laughs> Susan yeah, is just like taking whatever's first in the odds <laughs> for everything. <laughs> I think I, 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 that always happens when I overthink an award. Like the awards I cover, especially like Grammys and, and stuff like that, someone always beats me there just by picking the first place ranked uh, nominees. Um, yeah, well, I mean, but yeah, we both agree on, on Killing Eve, uh, though I'm not confident. Uh, how about you, Joyce? Um, I have winner in first, uh, partially because, again, I want uh, Better Call Saul to win something but also because of its title. Like, how do you not want to mm -hmm. vote for an episode called Winner and make it the winner? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's also the season four finale, which was very memorable, and it ended with the line, Saul Goodman. Um, so, uh, and this is one of the more open years, I think, um, that it could actually win. I have Succession in two. Again, like you said, like that is a very writerly show. 
and it's Jesse Armstrong. Um, like, and I think anyone, again, like anyone who's watching season two currently, while they were voting, might be encouraged to just vote for Succession in writing. Um, it has the best ins insults on TV. Um, and <laughs> with Game of Thrones, I, I mean, I know they nominated it, and it's the finale, but it also got you know we've talked about this before multiple times about how bad the writing was this season <laughs> and everyone knows the best written episode this season was the second episode night of the seven kingdoms but obviously it wasn't written by david and db so and they never submit more than one episode that they did not write because they don't want a vote split so that one was, was written by brian cogman and he didn't go rogue and self-submit or anything so i feel like with I mean, like for all we know, Game of Thrones here, Iron Throne, could have been the sixth nominee. You know, it just made it in. But now, when you actually have to pick the winner, do they actually want to vote? These writers in the writing branch want to vote for a season, an episode that was, you know, reviled for its writing to win the writing Emmy, even though it's given them writing awards before for not very well written episodes comparatively to its fellow nominees. So I have that in fourth and I have Killing Eve in third just because that's I for some reason the top pick right now. Um and then I have Bodyguard, which I love, but it really flopped with only two nominations in fifth. Mm -hmm. And I actually have Holly in sixth just because I like Bodyguard more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I feel like given what we saw with Alfie Allen getting in um, and Gwendolyn Christie getting in, the writer of A Night of the Seven Kingdoms, HBO needs to pay him such a big bonus because by not submitting himself, he didn't get nominated. He absolutely would have gotten nominated if he had submitted himself, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because we saw three Game of Thrones episodes get in for directing. Um, and I think given the choice between the two, like, given that they love Game of Thrones so much this year, and there's one obviously non-divisive choice for writing among the Game of Thrones episodes, he would have won the Emmy. <laughs> yeah, and like, honestly, if, if he had been submitted, like, I would have been fine with him winning. Like, yeah. I mean, I, that was a good episode. <laughs> but if there's Iron not even Throne any controversy for writing... Over the writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so I feel like, you know, the fact that he, like, didn't submit himself and basically very possibly gave up an Emmy. Um, like, and one that honestly, David Benioff and DB Weiss, the show has won best drama series three times and they've won writing twice. They have plenty of Emmys. Um, they have enough. <laughs> yeah. So, so like they didn't need to like protect themselves here. They could have gone with, they could have been generous and been like, you can submit to. Yeah, and, and honestly, it, I more I think about it, the more I think Night of the Seven Kingdoms would have won this category. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially if they'd been even nicer and said, like, you know, we'll just enter that one because we know everyone loved that episode. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been a lock to win this. Um, so, yeah, get, uh, uh, HBO, give him a fruit basket, um, like a huge bonus. Like maybe all of the profits from season eight, <laughs> and, and um and 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 like an exclusive like multi million dollar contract for whatever he wants to do next because he deserves it. Um. So what are you predicting, Marcus? Um, it's so interesting because I don't ever recall in TV history a campaign to try to get something rewritten and done again <laughs> like Game of Thrones, and knowing that the voters still voted for the finale. I think that shows a huge outpouring of support and maybe a backlash to the backlash. And for that reason, I'm picking it to win. And like you said, there's no vote split here for Game of Thrones. So that also helps it. Um, so I have that at number one. I have Killing Eve at number two because I don't know how smart the voters are in terms of who actually wrote this episode. I don't believe the writer's names are on the ballot. So they think that they're voting for Phoebe Waller-Bridge, which is really funny. Um, and I have winner in number three. I want winner to win, but until Better Call Saul actually wins an Emmy, it's hard for me to pick it in any category, to be honest. Uh, and then I have Holly in fourth. And this succession episode, this is the finale, right? Yeah. That was the best episode of the yeah, whole season. And it sets up season two with Kendall, like, yeah. Mm. 
And they did that thing where they follow all the characters for the first half, and then something happens, and we follow mm-hmm. one character for the rest of the episode. I love when shows do that. Uh, Six Feet Under, Under did that one year with Michael C. Hall's character getting kidnapped. And it's just, I don't know if it can win this against such strong competition, but if it does win, it totally deserves it. Yeah. The thing about Winner and Better Call Saul, it's, it's the right title for an Emmy contender. Um, <laughs> but like, I'm just, we remember how much Emmys loved Breaking Bad, especially as it went on towards the end. It didn't win writing until its last year. Um, and so that makes me, you know, think that, and there's no specific urgency to reward it this year when there are these other nominees in this category. So I feel like... Uh, but yeah, is there really an urgency to award any other of these episodes? Like, you could argue Iron Throne, but... <laughs> like Iron <laughs> Throne is the last episode. <laughs> Iron Throne is the last episode, so there could be farewell passion there. Like, that, um, that's it. Killing Eve got a big uptick this year, and it's sort of fuzzier now than it even was in season one. So I think there could be a certain amount of momentum there that gets it, you know, to to where it goes. And Succession is a first time show that just aired during the summer, so I think there's some momentum there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've got winner in fourth. Stranger Things have happened. Um, not in this category, though, because Stranger Things didn't win Best Writing, <laughs> even though I thought it would um, <laughs> the first time. Well, the only other thing I'll say is that since the new system, um, every year until last year, writing and directing has gone to the same show, like Game of Thrones, um, for two years, and then Handmaid's Tale. And then last year was the first time it split with The Crown and The Americans. So it'll either go back to like one show for both, or it'll split again. <laughs> Yeah, I think if it's one show for both, we'll see Game of Thrones take both. Um, otherwise, it's it's hard to think of any other show that would win both. Because uh, even if Killing Eve wins writing, I don't see it winning directing. Um, uh, I don't see... Like, if they re- really like Succession, I could see it winning both, but I don't think it will win both. Yeah, it would be really funny for Succession to yeah. only win writing. It's the best written show of the year and the best directed show of the year. Its only other nomination is Best Drama Series. It's very unlikely to win that this year. Um, so it would be, and imagine like, you know, it, I think it has five nominations overall. What if it wins everything but Best Drama Series? <laughs> That's like traffic. At the it would be the traffic <laughs> of the, uh, or, or more recently, the Bohemian Rhapsody of the, uh, of the I Emmys. was trying not to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're, speaking of writing that people were petitioning against. Peti- petitioning against. <laughs> uh, well, with that, um, we hope, uh, everyone, thank you for watching. We hope we have given you some insights. Uh, more than we've just confused you as to how these categories will go. We are very, very confused about some of these. Um, And thank you, Marcus, Joyce, and Susan for joining me. And we will see what happens on Sunday night.